statistics suggest that family wealth often battles to transfer beyond the third generation. This happens as families become far too accustomed to a high standard of living and they neglect to be economically active. A contributing factor to this could be an unreasonable standard of living relative to the asset base brought on by a false sense of the value of money. But there are examples of intergenerational uh, wealth working. So what are some of the rules families need to adhere to Quibi, uh, this, the, uh, the rules in terms of managing wealth and the passing wealth on from one generation to the next are very simple, but uh, people perhaps uh, tend to forget them and uh, complicate matters. Uh, but just run us through what are uh, considered to be the five elements of, of manage in, in managing intergenerational wealth. Yeah, I mean, I think, Samantha, I think firstly, I think you make a classic point by saying that sometimes these things seem so easy. They seem nearly, nearly trivial in comparison to some of the other more kind of quantitative decisions one needs to make as far as capital management is concerned. But I can't tell you how often people actually get this kind of stuff wrong. And I mean, Ian sitting next to me here, we'll talk a little bit about that just now. But just look at your screen now. You'll see a, a snapshot of a, um, of, of a study that was done by Paul Shervish in 1995. Uh, the paper there is called Passing It On, The Transmission of Wealth uh, and Financial Care. And you can see he, he literally highlights five different elements uh, that parents need to get right in order to ensure that you can actually see intergenerational wealth and the transfer, the successful transfer of wealth. And the first one of those is historical forces. Those are the forces that have shaped us as individuals uh, during our own past. Economic lifestyle, parental modeling is number three, institutional training is number four, and number five is that creating a framework of consciousness. And I think what we should do is we should spend a little bit of time maybe dealing with each one of those, yep. uh, th those today. So Ian, welcome to the show. Great to have you with us. Uh, talk to us about historical f uh, forces and the uh, context that that has in regards to creating intergenerational wealth. Sure, um, absolutely. I mean, we, we sort of specialize in, in its objective decision making for, for clients. And uh, once we're managing their wealth, uh, this whole wealth transfer thing is a really big topic that we need to deal with. And before we even get onto that, we need to actually say there's really three levels of what we need to look at. The first level is we need to just have the legal documentation in place. And there's, there's a lot of people, and it's amazing. Uh, you know, I had a, a client who had 50 million rands worth of, uh, of business assets and actually hadn't got around to doing a will. Um, he, was, he, he was a new client, thankfully. And uh, so people often neglect that sort of thing, especially entrepreneurs that are really good at what they do. So you've got to get all your paperwork together. Secondly, you've got to actually design a strategy for once you've transferred that wealth. How's it going to be managed? What is the guidance for the people that are actually managing it? And are there any parameters that you need to put in place? Then obviously the third thing is, what do you need to do now to prepare your heirs to actually run their financial lives even while you're alive, as well as after you're dead? And can your wealth actually be destructive to them? And I think that's, uh, that, that's part of the research that, that uh, you're looking at. So when we're talking about uh, the context that, uh, that someone is born into, of course, the generation, you've, you've had the, uh, the, 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 our grandparents who were born into the, uh, into the Great Depression, and of course, uh, the, the, their views on managing wealth and saving is very different to those who were born at a time of prosperity. Absolutely. I mean, if we compare my the mom... The dot-com bubble. Yeah, yeah no, the dot-com bubble, all of those issues. If we compare my mother to maybe my son, we can clearly see that my mom did without. You know, they only got jam and butter on Sundays. Um, and, and then after the war, to wait till after, you know, a long Second World War before they could actually get certain things. They had long periods of want. There were days when, you know, the meal was just a bit tight. Uh, whereas our kids, I don't think my kids have ever sort of gone hungry because there wasn't any food on the table. So I think uh, that actually drives and manages your perspectives. Uh, and it makes a big difference to how you handle wealth. So your whole upbringing is going to guide your decision making and your values. You know, I mean, if you look at those historical forces, um, I think the paper has got a fantastic example about this individual who actually runs a brewery, and he owns a brewery, and he started this brewery years and years and years ago with very little capital, and it's just compounded it out over time. And people ask him today, his kids say, listen, you know, we, we, we are seriously wealthy. You know, relative to the average American, we're seriously wealthy. And he says, no, we're not, because we can lose it tomorrow. And that's kind of the, the viewpoint that you get is, uh, when, you, when you think about people that kind of grew up during the Great Depression. It can all be gone tomorrow, so the best you save for tomorrow. Whereas when, you, when you're a baby boomer, or potentially a Generation X or a Generation Y today, and we're now talking kind of about this generation kind of issues, you know, you kind of think about assets in, 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 a, in a fundamentally different way as well. Just, I mean, Roland, the way in which people actually earn money also changes dramatically. I mean, Generation Xs have made far more money than their baby boomer parents. Yeah, I think, I think people over time have also been focusing very much on um, 
different t types of work. So in the past, you had like jobs for life, you, you, you earned a salary and you built wealth by saving. Nowadays, um, many people have built ex ex uh, extreme levels of wealth, not necessarily through saving, but through shares or, or, or you know, sh uh, ownership in companies. And I think the whole world is becoming much more entrepreneurial than it was 50 years ago. So uh, the wealth can be uh, quite volatile because a lot of the wealth is paper-based sort of um, wealth in, in terms of shares that, that are volatile. And one has to clearly try and diversify and manage that, that kind of risk. But um, I don't know what, what you would advise uh, to, 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 to clients who have a lot of share wealth rather than cash or, or physical assets in, 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 their, in their portfolio. And is it, is it a different approach? Well, I think, you know, the big answer, a client going and consulting with us and then pulling, pulling someone like Roland in as, a, as an analyst, an analyst to, to look at the, the fundamentals, um, the, the number would, no, the question would normally be, how can we make sure that we continue to grow the number and, uh, and and continue to grow and become even wealthier for the next generation. So it becomes that the answer they're looking for is how can we make it bigger? And I think a fundamental fact is that more isn't always better. Uh, appropriate is normally best. So obviously you don't want to lose money, um, but you need to look at it. And we've just had the wealthiest, uh, one of the wealthiest men in the United States, Warren Buffett, give away a couple of you know $42 billion because he, his family didn't need it. And I think he'd groomed them so well not to need it that actually he needed to transfer further on. So those are the, the sort of issues one touches uh, with these uh, with wealth transfer. I mean we're talking here, yeah, I mean we talk if we're talking about historical forces, we're talking about an older generation mm. relating to a younger generation. Mm. And it's kind of regardless of the, the, the factors that shape the older generation, how do you actually relate to you know to, to, to the so, younger so generation? So as a parent you basically need to see what generation your children are born into, what their mentality is and how that might be different to yours and how that's going to infect, affect mm. the way they manage the wealth you pass on. Yeah no, absolutely and I mean I mean, if you just if you just quickly look at the screen, you'll see that actually many 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 parents actually get this stuff wrong. You can see here these are wealthy parents' common concerns about their heirs. This is some work that was done by U.S. Trust uh, during 2000, so it's a little bit out of date. But I think much of this continues to be uh, kind of on the foreground of people's minds. You can see there's 60 percent of individuals say too much emphasis on material things. Not, not too much on running businesses, but how, what, what money can buy. 55% said naive about the value of money and 52% they spend beyond their means. You know, it's kind of again on the kind of liability side. It's not on the asset creation yeah. side. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, you, you've got to blame parents for that. Well, could be. I mean, I'm going to pick up a point there. 60% are concerned about the fact that they, they too, there's too much materialism in, in what they're doing. And, uh, um, you know, I think nowadays people, are, are their whole identity is wrapped up in what phone they're carrying, what jeans they're wearing and what car they're driving. And it's very important, even specifically for younger kids, specifically of wealthy families. I mean, I've driven through Danefern and seen you know, a Range Rover with an L plate on it, and it can't be good for people. So I think that's, that's the sort of thing that you have always historically, you know, your parents were pretty much, what was your standing in the community? It was, you know, community first, self second. Um, there were different kinds of values. And we need to actually, unfortunately, if you've built that value already, you can't go and fix it through a trust deed. You've actually got to fix it through mentoring but, and, but uh, yeah. As, as a parent, you, you, you can only do so much, right? Because yeah. you live in a society and, and often societies put pressure on you. So um, you can be the best possible role model for your kids in terms of financial wisdom um, and still get it wrong because the kids are driven by what happens outside of the house or mm. outside of the family circle. Mm. Um, and that's very hard to, 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 to uh, control or, or to... to Influence. Well, I think we're going to touch on one of these, the, the, the other points on that diagram later, which is basically the, the whole sort of values framework that's, uh, that people uh, base their, their training of their children on. And historically, so it was parental modeling, basically. Parental modeling. Right? Teaching children to understand uh, the value of money uh, through uh, the way you approach your uh, wealth creation and the way you manage your own money. That's correct. And we almost had auto modeling because it was quite a you would have had a much more religious culture um, to, uh, 50, 100 years ago. And therefore, for those values that would have been more religious, uh, Christian or Jewish or whatever they were, uh, Muslim values would have been quite heavily entrenched. And it was almost auto, uh, like an autopilot auto almost. Yeah. And what's happened is as that's kind of seeped out of mainstream uh, community, uh, you get a scenario where um, people aren't actually expressing what their values are. Yeah. They actually, they kind of just, they're not sure what their values are. So they're not purposeful in actually uh, training their kids. And, and that's, so it is quite tricky, but we must always remember, we can't ever judge anyone. 
You can have the best parents in the world and you can have one kid that just goes wrong. There is a 20% unknown factor and that's just uh, the fact of life. The problem child, but let's, <laughs> let's talk about uh, making your children hungry to succeed and ensuring mm -hmm. that they have that drive in order to, to understand firstly the value of money, teaching them the value of money and uh, so that when they do inherit the money, whatever it may be, whatever size it may be, uh, they protect it and then grow it further. Look, from our side, you know, uh, the Boston College, they, they, they recently polled people and, and uh, some of the people just were saying things like, well, look, I really wanted to buy a Rolls in, 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 for, in our house in California, but we felt it just wouldn't be good for the kids. Um, there was another parent that said, we've specifically reduced the role of servants in our house because we wanted the children to be, and we've, it's, it's not really been something I've needed, but it's something we felt we've needed to, to guide the kids on and we've actually involved them in that. So do you encourage that to your clients? Do you see your clients here in South Africa doing the same? I think we do, it depends. On, on the clients and depends on where they where, where they're at and how much yeah. they want to engage at this sort of level um, and you know we're not in the sort of uh, can I call it we don't we don't coach at that level uh, with our clients but yes on the, the debate does can stretch to that when you start getting into this intergenerational wealth planning where we're saying well how, what are the kids doing now what are the issues and uh, you need to bear in mind who they are and and what they're doing so I think uh, that's that's absolutely critical to build fundamentals in place. But, but surely you're focusing, maybe could be you can answer this, surely one is focusing on the, um, the ability or the behavior of, of parents, which is very important, but we also need to train kids in the nuts and bolts of managing money, right? Absolutely. Um, so it's not just about servants and cars, it's mm. about uh, Understanding risk, understanding you know where you can uh, diversify and things like well, that. Well, you're moving to that, and then just that would go to the proactive stuff. So, in other words, as you're making decisions, you're actually helping your kids with those decisions. And uh, um, obviously, that research study was done on very, very wealthy families, and obviously, just there's huge excess. But I think in terms of financial decision making, there's lots of things you can do. For example, I know uh, of one client that's um, uh, uh, that has a few shares, might go and buy, for example, some Shoprite shares. I'm not, I'm not saying that's a share to go and buy. Please don't take. That that is advice, um, but he buys it because well, they, they go. Levels, most people <laughs> say, sure. but anyway. Okay, so they, they they would take that down to Shoprite because they they, they happen to shop there. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, son, we own a, a share of this yeah. business here. What do you think of this business? We're going to check the financials when when the half year comes out, and we'll just see how they're doing. And uh, just to actually start to train them on that. The other exercise that I heard of was a varsity friend whose dad said, okay, my boy, get yourself a job during the holidays for pocket money next year, and I'll double whatever you earn. He went and got a sales job selling paintings, made 20,000 rand, and arrived at Varsity the next year in those days with a BMW. So, because um, his dad had to double it and he honored that commitment. And that's a way to start actually incentivizing the kids to, to actually go and work and actually uh, trade. Making yeah, I mean, it's, people it's, hungry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and that's what it comes down to. Is if you, you know, I see a lot of parents say, you know what, I've got, I've, I've worked really hard to achieve a certain amount of financial, financial, you know, financial uh, 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 means. And from a materialistic perspective, why can't I enjoy this? Why is it that I now have to sit back and not enjoy any of this? Mm. Well, quite frankly, having kids means that you need to instill a value system. And the value system that drove you in the beginning in order to create the wealth, you need to somehow go and instill that. Now, how do you do that? Well, the only way to do that is to create the need. And I mean, there's classic examples where parents go and create bank accounts from the earliest age for their kids, where they've got a set amount of money you know, to, to spend. And where over time, they slowly start introducing them into what is called and this is one of the factors, institutional training, mm. you know, trying to get them to say, listen, we have to make a decision as a family. What is it that we're going to be doing here? And it might, got, it might have to do with stocks that you buy. It might have to do with a business decision that you need to make. It might even have to do just with a, with a straightforward nuts and bolts as far as a business is concerned. And these things become classically important. So would, so would you say, Ian, it's important to have kids involved in the strategic planning, I suppose, sessions, if you could call them that, of managing uh, a family's wealth? Would you, would you include them from a young age and say, okay, this is where we stand as a family in terms of how much money we are, how wealthy we are, basically, and we'd like to grow our wealth, this is where our assets lie, and including them in those kind of discussions? I would certainly encourage that, and certainly when you start building them into smaller decisions and aspects of that wealth from an, uh, an earlier age. But when you're younger, you just, you just want what you want. You want what you want and you want comfort and you want whatever is nice and whatever is attractive. So you need to manage the maturity of, of the child, but you certainly need to get in on the decision making. And I think when, when a, parents that have successfully involved their kids 
you know, uh, um, Donald Trump's kids used to build Lego buildings in his office while he was doing deals building you know, skyscrapers. There was a, a family that would take their kids down to do Habitat for Humanity house builds that they would fund and they would say, look guys, this is the money that we've got, we've earned this money, we're going to get like 10% you know, of it or 20% of it and we're going to give it to build some houses, we're going to go along and do it. And but involving not, the kids in that... Not everyone has a Donald Trump as sure. a father. So, no, so sure. what do you do if your father's not Donald Trump and you sure. can't learn by osmosis? Key sure. thing, if you had to sum it up... Uh, most important aspect of uh, in ensuring intergenerational wealth? Work one-on-one -on -one with them, give them responsibility for money and decisions, uh, involve them and help them understand your decision process. So as you're evaluating two options, the expensive one and the cheaper one, help them understand why it made sense to go with the more expensive or the cheaper option. I think that's the key.